Hey y'all, before we start the video, we have to address the elephant in the room. I'm sure over the last few weeks, you've heard a lot about New Zealand. I was actually working on this video when it happened, and as such, many of the clips in this will be from before I was aware. New Zealand is in pain right now. Many of our loved ones down in Christchurch were people that came from poor, war-torn, struggling countries and came here to find a safer and a better life. And an awful person with an awful ideology thought that being born somewhere else and worshipping in a different religion made them lesser. We've all contributed to this. We've all harbored some of those thoughts, thinking of other people as lesser for one reason or another. That can't be accepted, and we all need to do better. When Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was asked what America can provide for New Zealand right now, all she asked for was for love and sympathy for all Muslim communities. We need to follow her example, be better, be more loving, be more accepting of everyone, and particularly those different from us. I'm an immigrant to New Zealand. My flatmates are immigrants to New Zealand, from South Africa and from Croatia. But I strongly suspect that we are not the type of immigrants that are disliked, despised, othered. We blend in based on the color of our skin and our beliefs. That can't be accepted. We need to accept everyone, be more loving, and be better. This is still a very raw wound, and I would really appreciate if none of the questions in future Q&As are about this. If you really have something you need to say or something you need to ask, my email is below the video and you can send something there, but I really don't want to address this more than we have to. Be more accepting, be more loving. Do not accept viewing other people as lesser because they are from a different background. So with that out of the way, let's get to science. I'd like to, I'd like to get it light. I'd like to keep it pertinent to science. This isn't what I want these videos to be about, but it would be wrong and disingenuous to act as though nothing has changed, to act as if this country hasn't fundamentally changed in the last two weeks. So let's get to science and let's answer some of the questions you had. Hey y'all, thanks for all the questions. It's pretty odd but cool to have a Q&A about a Q&A. Uh, getting really deep into the topics there, yeah. So first question from Ethan, if you could be any animal, what would you be? Also, what do you do with the dead chemist? Bury him. Really, Ethan? Really? As for what animal I would want to be, uh, certainly something that doesn't get eaten. Something at the top of the food chain. That would be a bad way to go. So, like, a lion or an albatross, maybe? Uh, those would be pretty cool. Um, maybe something underwater, because, like, humans don't really get to explore underwater a lot. Even if you're scuba diving or something like that, you're not really, uh, you're not in your element. So... Maybe a leopard seal? Leopard seal would be pretty cool. Yeah, I think I'll go with that. They're pretty wide ranging. They're top of the food chain. They get to see underwater. Yeah, I think I would go leopard seal. Caden asked, what is the worst animal you've studied? Definitely Sicilians. Sicilians are awful. We called them the nightmare worms. They were the worst thing ever. Worked with them at San Antonio Zoo, checking them for chytrid fungus, which is a fungal disease that is infecting amphibians around the world. So they're not literally worms, as you might have guessed from me saying that it's infecting amphibians around the world. They're actually amphibians. They're the third group after salamanders and frogs. They are the worst. They have really disgusting, evil-looking teeth, and they attack each other. We had them in this bucket when they first arrived, and they would go around and around in circles and then launch themselves out of the bucket. And it was just the most terrifying, awful thing, and no one wanted to work with them. But thankfully, we didn't have to work with them very long. We were just like testing them and sent them off, and uh, yeah, I, I never want to work with them again. Sicilians are awful. Isaac asked, what animal do you relate to? Manatees. I think I, I relate most to a manatee. They're pretty chill. They just float along and eat lettuce and hang out. I think they have it together. Andres asked, what editing software do you use? So previously I used VideoPad Editor because it's free, but it was kind of frustrating me yeah, how the text would kind of move from where it said it was going to be, and then it wouldn't be there, uh, kind of like right here. When y'all were doing the voting, it slid some letters over. It's done it a few times, and it was just bothering me. Uh, so I'm now trying out Adobe Premiere, which is very expensive, but the university paid for it, or I got a license from the university because it's being used for science purposes. So this will be the first one using it. Carson asked, can you dab? Yes, I can, and I would if it was 2017 still. Jarrell asked, how long are you going to grow your beard out? So my beard doesn't really grow out. It kind of just like curls and gets thicker. So, uh, 
that hasn't really come up. It kind of just stays more or less at this length, just getting like thicker. Uh, the only bit that actually grows out is the pharaoh part. I, I really look like a pharaoh. It just grows out like this, just right at the chin. Uh, so I trim that down. I don't think I want to grow it longer unless it matches the rest of the beard. If you could have one other job, what would it be? Panda zookeeper. Definitely panda keeper. That would be the best game to hang out with pandas, especially if they're baby pandas. That would be the best. It would have to be something with nature or science. Uh, um, I can't really picture myself working in like any other field, to be honest. Maybe like park ranger, zookeeper, science teacher, science communicator, something like that. Uh, that I would enjoy, but I, I think it would have to be something in this field, either like nature or science related. If you could go anywhere, where would you go? So I have a list of five places that I wanted to go through my life, my bucket list, already knocked two off, and that was the offshore islands of Otero, New Zealand. I've seen quite a few of them by now. Um, I wanted to go to an African savanna. I wasn't picky about which one. I kind of just wanted to see that landscape and those animals that you only find in African savanna. And I saw Velkabond in Nausfle in South Africa, so got that ticked off. Uh, so the last ones that I would really want to go to are St. Andrew's Bay in South Georgia. If you've ever seen pictures of king penguins, it's almost certainly from St. Andrew's Bay. It is this just enormous king penguin colony down there. That's to the east of South America, just enormous, enormous king penguin colony, and it would be amazing to see that. I also would want to see the limestone forests of Madagascar, where they have those razor rocks and the lemurs live all in there. And then also the Galapagos Islands, because they have the whole history of biology as well as getting to swim with iguanas and penguins and uh, seeing the giant tortoises up on land. It would just be an amazing place to visit, you know, wildlife-wise, history-wise, science-wise. So Trevor asked, would the painted dog bite a human? So we really have to be careful when we're talking like that. Um, everything with teeth will bite, especially if they feel threatened. Just because something bites when it feels threatened does not mean it's dangerous, and it doesn't mean that you should ever be worried about them. That's the case with a painted dog. They are no more dangerous than a domesticated dog or a human if you don't bother them. Uh, that's the same thing for almost all wildlife. If you don't bother them, nothing will happen to you. Don't go into their habitat, don't approach them, and especially don't corner them. That's the case with painted dogs. They'll defend themselves if cornered and if they feel threatened, but they're going to try to avoid a fight if they can. Easton asked, have you played any sports? What's your favorite sport? Yeah, I played lots of sports. Uh, I played soccer when I was younger, and then starting in middle school, I started playing football all the way through high school. You can actually see the trophy from the year that I was playing football at SMA. Uh, I played variously at different times, tight end, outside linebacker, and defensive end. And then starting in high school and through college, I played rugby, which is my favorite sport. I absolutely love rugby. And so at various times, depending on basically how big I was at the time, I played flanker, which is like a linebacker and a fullback fly half which is like a quarterback and a safety and wing which is like a wide receiver and a corner because you play offense and defense in rugby uh yeah so those are the positions i played yeah i think rugby is definitely my favorite it's a really exciting time for rugby right now because uh the u.s just got a professional league there's actually two teams in austin and houston now and world cup this year so really exciting time for rugby carly said i like the second picture that you showed so that's the little baby takapu yeah i really like that one uh it's not so much a portrait like, most wildlife photos essentially look like portraits, even if they're flying or walking or whatever, it's just a portrait. This one is like a little social thing, and them growing up and interacting with their parents, it's really cool. Uh, here's a picture a few seconds after that other one, once uh, they had successfully begged some food from the parent. Jasmine says, your mom told me she prefers New Zealand compared to Iceland now. Does New Zealand top your travel list? Also, Spencer's the best is a fact. Yeah, it is. It is a fact. I'm really glad she enjoyed it. Uh, um, it was a really good visit. I'm really glad she enjoyed it. Um, I don't think it would be fair to say it like tops my list because there's every place you go is so different in so many different ways. Uh, Otero, I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. Anytime I get to travel around, it's it's always amazing. I really love it here. Uh, but there are a lot of other places that are really special just in different ways. So like Otero, the thing I would say it really shines in is it has like a diverse range of things to do. Like it has beaches and mountains and forests and cultural activities uh, and water. <laughs> like it's got so many things to do. It is primarily an outdoor place, though. So as far as, like, the cities aren't that entertaining, to be honest. Uh, Rotorua actually has kind of a nickname as being Rota Vegas. Like, it's kind of just artificial and pop-up attractions. Like, it, it's not real because there's nothing that entertaining in the cities here. So I'd say in that way, Scotland and Ireland pull far ahead. They have really interesting, amazing, fun, entertaining cities. Uh, Iceland is a bit more, like, awe-inspiring, less, like, classically beautiful landscapes and wildlife and stuff, but more like awe-inspiring. To be fair, I haven't been down to the Fjordlands at the far south of Otero, and they're supposed to be like Iceland-level awe-inspiring, so maybe I'll change my ranking then. 
I would still say Iceland's way up there. It's a fantastic place. And then Ireland and Scotland, I definitely prefer as far as the cities. Drake asked, how tall are you? Drake, you saw me in person last year. Like, you should know this. So I think I'm about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, um, like tall enough that I hit my head on doors in Europe and don't really fit in cars that well, but not so much that I like stand out from far away. Avery asked, who is your favorite basketball player? I don't really follow basketball at all. Uh, I guess in the last few years, Kawhi was fun to watch when he was with San Antonio, but yeah, I don't really watch basketball. McKinley asked, what is the most diverse place you've been? Uh, certainly South Africa. It had by far the greatest biodiversity. It was pretty astonishing. Small mammals, big mammals, including primates and just animals everywhere of many different types, amphibians, reptiles, the plant life is incredibly diverse. Uh, Cape Floristica down in the southwest of South Africa is the most diverse plant region outside of the Amazon. Uh, I didn't get to go there, but uh, it is an incredibly diverse area and it was pretty fascinating all the different things we'd see. Like the bird life was almost as unique as Oteoroa's. Maybe not as unique, but definitely as diverse. Just different types of birds everywhere. Um, it was pretty amazing and very diverse there. Carson also asked, also, do you think scientists can revive the dinosaurs? Uh, so there's a lot to unpack there and much more than can we? Because the can has a very simple answer. No. Uh, should and can long into the future, we have the possibility of something similar. That's where it gets really complex. So the short answer, no, we can't, because there's not going to be enough DNA to do it. So the half-life of DNA is 520 years. And what that means is after 520 years, half of the DNA molecules have decayed and we've lost that genetic information. So in just a few thousand years, you'll have lost almost all of the DNA. Even if it's preserved in something like amber, it's not going to be well-preserved and certainly not for millions and millions and millions of years. So there's not enough DNA to clone a dinosaur. However, we could modify reptiles using genetic modification to create new dinosaurs or just create them from scratch. But that's not really reviving dinosaurs. It's kind of creating new dinosaurs. So it's not, it's not strictly the same thing. And once we're getting into that discussion, we're moving into the should we, because that's moving away from, oh, we're just bringing back from the grave to this is a project of creating a new species, essentially. They won't be the same thing. They might superficially look and act like dinosaurs, but they aren't the same thing. They're kind of a Frankenstein's monster that humanity created. And there's basically two reasons we would do it. It's either one, we want to bring back some individuals for our own benefit, essentially, our curiosity, our enjoyment or whatever. Or two, we're trying to bring them back as a species and have them be part of the ecosystem. So the first one I'm going to talk about in a little bit later, but that's essentially a moral argument of should we be doing that? The first one, let's talk about whether that's even possible, whether it's possible to bring them back as a species and establish them in an ecosystem. So the generally accepted value to prevent inbreeding and prevent like catastrophic birth defects is 50 individuals. That's the minimum you can have in a population for the offspring to not be really malformed, essentially. 500 is preferred to prevent the majority of those impacts. So that's more realistically what you'd be looking at if you're trying to create a new species or bring back a species. And 500 has to be 500 genetically distinct ones, ones that are more separate than like second, third, fourth cousins, ones that are completely genetically separate. So we can't just take clones and change a few genes here and there. They have to be essentially 500 unrelated, very distinct, individually designed individuals. And that would be an enormous undertaking. Now let's also think about the human aspect to it. Most people on Earth think gorillas and lions and tigers and chimps and all those animals are good for the Earth. And it's good to have them. You know who doesn't think that? The people that live near them. Because those animals disrupt their life and destroy their livelihoods quite often. Uh, ripping up crops, tearing down fences and houses, and sometimes getting into direct conflict with humans. And those are just like animals that we're aware of and know they're nearby. Governments and NGOs try to limit those interactions by like compensating farmers for their losses uh, and putting up fences, all those sorts of things. But there's still tons of conflict. I mean, you can even see it there in Corpus with coyotes and with javelinas, that there's quite a bit of conflict. Now imagine that's a T-Rex. Actually, imagine it's 500 T-Rexes, because that's how many you need for the genetic diversity. You would need 500 T-Rexes stomping around in an area. I think you'd be very hard-pressed to convince people that's good to have added in. People can accept that the animals were living there before, and, you know, we tolerate them, whatever. But you'd be really hard-pressed to convince someone to add 500 T-Rexes to their area. 
And then there's the question of whether they would even survive once we get past that human aspect. Would they even be able to survive in this current environmental situation? The dinosaur era was a very different time. There were enormous and fast-growing plants that took advantage of the high temperatures, high humidity, high oxygen content, low carbon content of the atmosphere. So they were able to grow faster, to feed bigger herbivores, to feed bigger carnivores. And I imagine we're not going to be bringing back, you know, the tiny little raptors. If we're bringing back dinosaurs, we're wanting the big ones. So those are ones that are going to need lots and lots and lots of food. And simply, the current biota of the world, the living organisms of the world, don't support that. Uh, it would have to be a very small number of dinosaurs in an area with a lot of wildlife, somewhere like the Amazon, um, the Congo River Basin, those sorts of places. And they'd be incredibly disruptive to those areas. You also have the issue of mammals. Mammals weren't really a thing yet in the dinosaur era, and now they kind of are. And especially the mammalian predators would be a problem for dinosaurs. You see, dinosaurs being cold-blooded have a natural disadvantage compared to mammalian predators. For any chemical reaction to happen in a body, there needs to be a certain amount of heat, a certain amount of energy. And warm-blooded animals, we use a lot more energy, but that keeps our temperature up. Any reaction we need to happen can happen right away. With a cold-blooded animal, they need to go get that heat and then do the chemical reaction. That's why they bask in the morning. And the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction. And that's why mammals are the fast animals of the earth. Or birds as well, uh, but they're also warm-blooded. Reptiles are much, much slower because they're dependent on storing up that heat. That's why most reptilian predators these days are ambush predators. They're, they know we can't chase down a mammal, especially not for a long time. So we kind of have to get the drop on them, either snakes dropping out of trees, crocodiles popping out of ponds, those sorts of things. So mammals, being able to run at a moment's notice, are much better equipped to be predators. So any carnivorous dinosaurs will be outcompeted by lions and tigers and jaguars and all those things. And any herbivorous dinosaurs would quite likely get taken down by those same predators or just outcompeted by the mammalian herbivores. And then we also get into the moral aspect of it. Because if they can't survive in the wild like that, that would necessitate putting them in zoos or wildlife parks. And it's generally accepted these days that the role of a zoo is for conservation. It's to keep a breeding stock of rare endangered organisms in case the wild populations drop too low and you need to reintroduce some more individuals from captivity to, to up the numbers in the wild. If you're planning to do this for a species that you have no intention of ever putting in the wild, that puts you in quite the ethical dilemma. Zoos are already being pressured to release or stop breeding of species that aren't suitable for zoos. Either A, they don't thrive in zoos, they don't survive that well, things like great whites, orcas, uh, some elephants, rhinos, those things. Or two, ones that there's not a conservation reason to keep them in the zoo. And so that would be ones that aren't endangered, ones that you don't really need that breeding stock to up the wild numbers. And dinosaurs would kind of be that type two taken to the extreme of its definition because you have no intent to ever release them. Like something that we have huge numbers of mice and rats, there is a potential somewhere in the world for them to go extinct. Something catastrophic goes wrong and mice and rats are going to go extinct. It's virtually impossible. It's very unlikely, but it is a possibility. If you have no intention of ever releasing the dinosaurs, that means you are creating a species purely to be kept in captivity. So with all that in mind, essentially bringing back the dinosaurs would be bringing back limited individuals, not the whole species, to keep in zoos for very morally suspect reasons. So I think even if someday we're able to, we're not going to. So an interesting alternative to this is bringing back the Ice Age. The Ice Age was much more recent, so a lot more of the genes, a lot more of the DNA molecules have actually been preserved. So we have more of that available. We, depending on the species, we might be able to get up to that 500 individuals number. They're better suited to the current climate. They're more used to the oxygen and carbon levels of the modern world. You know, carbon levels are much higher than they were a couple hundred years ago, but it's more in touch with what it was in the Ice Ages relative to dinosaur times. They're more used to the other plants and animals in general they're better equipped for surviving in the modern world. Also, the Ice Age species would want to live in cold places. They would want to live in like Siberia and northern Canada, whereas dinosaurs would need to be in warm places like the most populated regions of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, uh, Central America, and northern South America. Those sorts of places are very highly populated, and you would have a lot of conflict if you introduce new animals into them, new predators even. That would be less of a problem with the Ice Age animals because they would want to be in pretty unpopulated regions like Siberia and northern Canada. So it would be less of an issue. And this is actually already being done to an extent. 
in northeastern Russia, there's a project called Pleistocene Park that's looking at the viability of create recreating the ecosystem that mammoths thrived on. And that was the steppe grassland. It was this cold, cold grassland that was controlled by tons and tons of herbivores. That's what they're trying to do right now. They're actually making some progress on it. It's been running for a few years now. And they're really starting to see that the ecosystem is changing and adapting to the herbivores. And if there comes a time that we're able to clone mammoths, it might be viable to actually put them there. So it's a pretty cool alternative to bringing back dinosaurs, bringing back the Ice Age. And it's something that could viably happen in our lifetime.